God created the universe to be a home for humans, for animals, for everything else he created. The universe is hostile to life. The depths of space are freezing cold, planets are inhospitable, and the sun's just a blazing fire. So if God was intending to create a home for life, why would he create it in such a hostile environment? The vastness of the universe fascinates me, but it, it's, I'm not overwhelmed by it. I think it's just an indication of how powerful God really is. The vastness of the universe doesn't detract from the importance of humans. If anything, it makes us more important because out of all of the space, we've got life. And I think that that's a miracle. Life is an accidental byproduct of chance. It has no intrinsic purpose. And therefore, it's down to us alone to give it purpose. God made the universe as a home for us and it's our duty to look after it. The more the universe is comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Words of the Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. He goes on here to dismiss life as, I quote, a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents. <laughs> Which is more or less what Rachel was saying. Life is an accidental byproduct of chance. It has no intrinsic purpose. And therefore, it's down to us alone to give it purpose. And it's not difficult to understand why Weinberg and Rachel feel like that. You know, the most prominent objects in the sky are the stars, great balls of fire like our sun. The depths of space are freezing cold. Most planets are not hospitable for life. There are violent supernova explosions, black holes that suck in everything within reach and crushes them down to a point. And everything about the cosmos is so big. 100 billion stars in our galaxy, 100 billion galaxies and all this spread over vast regions of space. No one cannot help but feel small and insignificant. But first impressions can be misleading. Take the size of the universe. Yes, it's big, but it, it had to be big if, if we were to be in it. It took nine billion years before the Sun and Earth formed. It then took another four and a half billion years for evolution to produce us humans. And during all that time, the universe was expanding in the aftermath of the Big Bang. Expanding at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. Well, now I ask you, keep that up for a total of 13.7 billion years, and the universe ends up big. The fact that we're here means the universe couldn't have been any smaller. Lucy. The vastness of the universe fascinates me, but it, it's, I'm not overwhelmed by it. I think it's just an indication of how powerful God really is. Since the 1960s and 70s, there's been a growing realisation of just how misleading first impressions of the cosmos might be. It's come to be recognised that the universe is not so hostile to life as was previously thought. For example, it was discovered that if the strength of the forces of nature, you know, gravity responsible for the formation of stars, or the electrical forces holding the electrons close to the nucleus of the atom, or the nuclear forces holding the nucleus together, if any of these had been different from what they are, then it would have been impossible for life as we know it to develop anywhere within the cosmos. You might not be able to have stars, and without the energy given out by stars, which are suns, evolution would not have been able to take place on a nearby planet. Or you might not even have been able to have atoms, let alone stars. And the same happens if you start messing around with the masses of the fundamental particles out of which everything is made, the, the mass of the electron, the proton and the neutron. Or if you alter the factors governing how rapidly the universe expands. Or indeed if you change the number of spatial dimensions. You know, for there to be life, it has to take place in our familiar three-dimensional space. Up, down, sideways, backwards, forwards. You can't have life in two, four, or, or any number of dimensions. So what we find is that, you know, contrary to, to what we might originally have thought, the universe, far from being hostile to life, has seemingly bent over backwards to accommodate us. The universe is, is life-friendly. It appears to have been fine-tuned for life. And this realisation goes under the name the Anthropic Principle. So, 
How do we account for this? Well, some people might want to claim that it's, well, it's all just a coincidence. <laughs> we just got lucky. The trouble with that is that we would have to count ourselves very, very lucky. The, the chances of getting all the conditions right for the development of life purely by chance are so remote, you'd have a better chance of winning the national lottery week after week after week. On the other hand, we have people who don't think it's a matter of chance. Hermione. God made the universe as a home for us and it's our duty to look after it. The universe looks fine-tuned for life because that's what it was. It, it was fine-tuned for life. From the beginning, it was consciously intended as a home for us humans and for other forms of life. And the fine-tuning was done by God. That's how God designed it. So that's another possibility. A potential problem with that line of reasoning is that it does rather remind us of another argument from design, the, the argument that everything about our human body is so beautifully suited to fulfil its function, it must have been designed that way, and therefore there must be a designer. And we know what happened to that argument. Along came science with its theory of evolution. So one can't help wondering whether at some point in the future science will come up with a theory that gives a natural explanation as to why the universe simply had to be the way it is, without the need to call on a designer. Personally, I, I can't see how that could be come about. You know, at least not if we are confined to just this one unique universe. But what if our universe was not alone? What, what if there were lots of universes, all run on different lines with their own laws of nature, their own values for the strengths of the forces and, and, and the masses of the, of the fundamental particles? Then that would radically alter their position. You know, if there were enough universes, then one might reasonably expect that eventually Eventually, one would come along that, purely by chance, had all the right conditions for life to develop. We, being a form of life, must, of course, find ourselves in one of these freak universes. This is the so-called multiverse idea. Problem solved. The trouble is that there's no proof of the existence of other universes. In fact, it's hard to imagine how we could ever get proof of the existence of anything other than what happens to be in our own little universe. Yet, despite this lack of proof, if you're the sort of person who discounts the idea of a designer god, then the life-friendly nature of our universe more or less forces you to accept the multiverse idea. Now, it, it, it's hard to see an alternative. Which is not to say that the multiverse idea is necessarily to be regarded as an alternative to believing in God. You know, for all we know, God might take a delight in producing lots of universes. Okay, he might have a particular interest in this one and any others that give rise to life, but well, he might also take an interest in, in all the others. In much the same way as he used evolution to produce humans who can relate to him, but not just humans. Evolution gave rise to lots and lots of interesting creatures. So we are left to ask, why is the universe friendly to life? Was it deliberately designed like that? Or was it just part of a much larger multiverse picture?